friends who will join us, are they also just from, from Moscow, do you think? Or? From Moscow, most of them, yeah. yes. Most of them, but yeah. not, not only from Moscow, <clears throat> I think. Yeah. Some of them went home, probably, for the holiday, uh, because this br break uh, is about to begin. Oh, right. Right. Just from, from Moscow, do you think? Oh, that's a lag, isn't it? Uh, that we've, we've got there. I, I had said that sentence a few seconds ago. Mm. Uh, one moment. I will also, I'm sending... Mm. No, it's very difficult to have an ordinary chat when there's a, a lag. The other day I was um, having a session with um, people in Iran and oh. the lag there was 10 seconds. Ah. It was awful. Um, mm -hmm. oh. So you make, you make a funny remark and nobody laughs. <laughs> and then you make a serious remark and they laugh. <laughs> oh dear. <clears throat> and you're all at home, I, I gather, yes, except Marklin, who looks as if he's in an office. Uh, no, 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 it's, it's a background. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, oh, it's... oh, very clever. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm just I'm advertising this event right now on Facebook and everywhere so that everybody would have an opportunity to see it. Therefore, just uh, uh, bear with me a second. I just I'm finishing. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. All right. So nearly there. I'm nearly there. Hmm. Okay, so um, also we have here uh, Professor Crystal. Let me introduce uh, Professor oh. Svetlana Dechiva. She is um, she she is a specialist in phonetics, and her yeah. her, her subject is uh, is cognitive syllabification, and she's working on phonetics. So we're working with the with the first and second year students, and uh, the, uh, all, also Professor Olga Vishnikova. She is a cognitive scientist, and she's um, she's also working a lot with postgraduates and. Uh, Young researchers. Right. Uh, I'm also glad to introduce uh, Ekaterina Dolgina. She is also a professor at our department. She is uh, her subject. She's working on grammar, and her her, her dissertation is devoted to to articles, to, to functionality of English articles. And we have Professor Menjeriska. She is working on discourse analysis. She is also there. Yeah. The associate Professor Anna Rudakova. She is also in charge of our conference organization and uh, uniting all our young all our young specialists and so on and so forth. Uh, so we can we can wait two minutes more probably and, uh, and then and, and then we may begin. I'm sure uh, you now feel more or less at home right now because you've been here with us for, for some time previously and uh, I, most, I most certainly do and I hope you will all have noticed that my beard has become more Russian. In recent years, <laughs> it, it, well, I think when I was with you, it was fairly small. But of course, since COVID, uh, it has had to grow uh, because hairdressers. What are hairdressers? They, they do exist, I suppose, but uh, you can't go to them. At least not in Wales uh, or in London, for that matter. So uh, it's gone bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, I was also I was always wondering, Professor Crystal, do you ever speak uh, speak uh, the native language of Wales. Oh yeah, Welsh. Yes, well, Welsh is my second language. Um, my my mother tongue was English at home. We had a, a a monolingual home, but Uncle Joe, who lived round the corner, he was a first language Welsh speaker, and he was absolutely insistent mm -hmm. that whenever I visited him, we speak in Welsh. I didn't know any, so he taught me. Um, and then, of course, you learnt it in school as well. And uh, I'm in this curious semi-lingual situation because my Welsh then continued and continued through primary school. But then at age 10, I left Wales and went to live in Liverpool, uh, where, of course, there was no Welsh, or at least anybody sounding Welsh was immediately uh, 
castigated by the local Liverpudlians. And <laughs> you, you don't, you, you, I very clearly remember at my uh, last year in primary school in Liverpool, the kids would come up to me. You know, the colloquial term for a Welshman is taffy, taffy. Yeah. <laughs> and they would say, hey, taffy. Hey, you know, strong local <laughs> accent. Hey, taffy, you, you, you don't speak like that here. You speak like us. And, and or, or, we'll, or we'll lip you, you know, uh, to lip somebody is to place the forehead at strength against the lip of the person you're talking to. And so I did not want to be lipped. So I, I lost my Welsh accent and adopted a Liverpool accent within a couple of days. That's incredible. And, it, and this taught me a good phonetic lesson, you phoneticians there, you see, um, how, how, it, how important it is to accommodate as quickly as possible in order to survive. Uh, evolution, the survival of the accent most fittest, as it were. So, yes, I, and then, of course, uh, later I got my first job in Wales again, in Bangor, um, and started to learn Welsh again. So I have this curious semilingual situation of having child Welsh and linguistics Welsh, but I don't have any teenage Welsh. And therefore, I don't have a lot of the slang and so on in my head that comes with a teenager and all the angst that comes with being a teenager. It's not there in Welsh. It is in English. And as a result, uh, I, I, when I, ever, I was interviewed in Welsh for a radio station a few years ago, I found it very, very difficult because I lacked that kind of mature colloquial development that comes with the teenage years. Very difficult. But still, I can understand Welsh well enough and speak it when I have to. Thank you. That, that, that was a wonderful introduction to our, to our discussion today. I think, I think it's great. So we begin with a language that is, that, that is not developing as quickly as English, but, uh, but which is very dear to so many people, right? Um, but first of all, I would, like, uh, I would like to give the floor to Svetlana Grigorievna Terminasova. She wanted to speak to you very briefly. She, she especially joined us to say hello to you. She doesn't hello. have anything, anything to, to, to say. Uh, Svetlana Grigorievna, you can say a couple of words. How lovely. How lovely to see you. I think her, her connection is not no, very... Just... No, all right. Yeah. You may speak, Slangdian. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can. Uh, do you have any questions? I to say that I remember them very well. Uh, first, I'm still alive. That's the best thing I can say now, because I was ill for some time, but I'm back to work. And enjoyed it. I'm enjoying it now more than before because I just celebrate that I can do it, that I like it, that I can, I must, etc., etc. Oh. And I'm very happy that you are here, that you are well, not here, but with us, and mm -hmm. um, that we can communicate. And uh, I remember very well how we um, spent together so much time at those yeah. uh, meetings of the British Council that united us. And I live by these memories. And thank you for just coming through the internet, all right? But we can see you, we can hear you. I love you. I remember very well your wife, Hillary, and our communications and our meetings. And I'm very, very happy that I repeat it, I'm still alive and I can communicate and I can participate. Uh, and um, so you know, I just don't know what else to say oh. because I don't want to occupy very, very precious time, David. Uh, I wish we could meet. That uh, is lovely, uh, lovely to hear you and to see you again. And yes, those British Council meetings—they were, they were so inspirational. And the only thing that is sad uh, about this um, interaction that we have now is that we don't have. Uh, the appropriate drink uh, and oh, and little sandwiches and things that you provided uh, at the university and elsewhere, especially the drink. I remember very, very well, uh, very, very. Unless, Mark, then you have got a technique for sending it through the computer. No, normally I'm doing that. Normally I'm sending around all just a coffee and uh, yeah. uh, some drinks if necessary. 3, 3D printing they have these days. So why not 3D <laughs> eating and drinking as well, I wonder. But yes, thank you, Svete. It's lovely to see you again. Thank you. 
So, all right. Um, so two more people joined us. Also, Professor Ludmila Chinyonova. She is also, uh, you, you also know her for sure. So, uh, she is, we can see only part of your face, Ludmila uh, Chinyonova. Therefore, you just if, if you can show yourself. Well, yes, yes. Ah, now, now we see all of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. <laughs> And also uh, Professor Kisirin Mihailovska, she's also a specialist in phonetics, but probably something is, is wrong with her camera. Hello, okay. very nice to see you all. Right. Okay. So let's, uh, let's begin. I'm afraid I can't show my face because my internet connection is not very stable. So <laughs> without my face, unfortunately. Yeah, right. but ph phoneticians don't need faces, do they? <laughs> <laughs> they need they just need ears. <laughs> Right. Uh, with, with your permission, I will briefly, since now it is two o'clock and well, surely we have, an, we have a big audience already watching us uh, in, on YouTube and Facebook, I will first ask everyone to switch off the microphone so that we shall, we shall have clear sound right now. And, uh, and this is very important, so that the broadcasting would be, would have a, would be of a very high quality. Um, I will briefly introduce you to our big audience not just not just here and then um, and then we shall begin our questions and answers sessions dear colleagues um i'm happy to uh, to see you all in our in our virtual uh, room uh, this whole, whole of lectures where we're going to discuss the future of english now in the time of the pandemics in the time of the internet and the time of distancing and uh, we're happy to hear to have here professor david crystal from Bangor University and a uh, person whom I think every, every intellectual in the modern world knows. And we know your, your encyclopedia of English and um, uh, all your books and articles, which, were, which are just enormously published by, by, by great publishing houses, which is very important. Um, uh, and now, since we already had an opportunity to talk to you previously, uh, Professor Crystal, now I give the floor to other people who wanted to ask their questions following our discussion and with your permission the first person to ask the question will be Professor Olga Alexandrova, Head of English Department at the Faculty of Philology, Moscow State University. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, David, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, we know each other for so many years, I should say. Yes. I really appreciate all your works and uh, I adduce examples uh, uh, from your books, which are very much appreciated by us, by our students, by our colleagues, and so on and so forth. You look wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Please give my regards to Hillary. Yes. yes uh, because uh, I know her as well. And uh, I think that uh, we uh, all continue our professional connections, which is very important for our professional work. <clears throat> so to start the discussion, I would like to ask one question. One book which I uh, usually mention in my lectures is uh, The English as the Global Language. Uh, really, English has become the global language in our world, which has become the global world in all respects, economically, politically, historically, and so on and so forth. But nowadays, as we are living under the circumstances, we are when we are <clears throat> when we have to be isolated somehow, um, uh, and uh, the connections between countries are not so close as they have been some years ago. So what do you think about the, fu the future of the English language? Will it be the global, will it uh, still uh, be the global language in the world? Or probably uh, something will be changed. So what is your opinion? Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you, Olga. And indeed, it's lovely to see you uh, and others uh, here. Happy memories of those many visits to Russia, especially in the 1990s, but uh, yeah. also into the 2000s. Um, <laughs> statistically, uh, there isn't any significant change uh, in the global status of English, as far as I can tell. Uh, many of you will know the Cambridge Encyclopedia of the English Language. Well, when I did the first edition of that in 1997 and did the review uh, as insofar as one can, because no country keeps 
good statistics about listening, speaking, reading and writing. Um, but as far as you can, you know, how many people are learning English in schools and in institutions, British Council data, all that sort of thing. And the conclusion was that 1.5 billion people were speaking English at the time, at least to a fairly domestic level. And then for the second edition, did the same exercise with the same criteria. And even though the statistics are always a bit uncertain, uh, the figure had grown to about 2,000 million, 2 billion. And here's the interesting point that I did the same thing for the third edition in 2019, well, 2018 for the survey. And the figure that came out was 2.3 billion. <clears throat> now, 2.3 billion, 2,300 million. Now, that means that English is continuing to grow. But if you work out the statistics, the growth rate seems to be flattening a little bit because 1997 to 2003, half a billion new speakers, but 2003 to 2019, if that rate had continued, it would be 3 billion now, but it isn't, it's 2.3. So there is a flattening, um, although still a, a, an increase and no other language is showing any kind of comparable growth at the moment. So there's no real sign of significant change yet. Uh, and the internet has now been with us for, well, 1990, you know, the best part of 30 years. Uh, and so you might have expected to see some sign, maybe that's one of the factors that has caused that flattening, or maybe there is simply a natural ceiling towards which any international language would want to be used globally. You know, I can't imagine a scenario where all 7 billion people in the world would want a global language. You know, most people would not. So there may be a natural end point to this, to this growth. What I see online is um, not so much a significant change in the statistics, but the development of new functions. And so, as always, with the arrival of a new technology, um, we saw it with broadcasting, we saw it with the telephone, we, we saw it with the telegraph. Uh, a new technology brings new functions, new varieties, if you like. I mean, think BBC and, uh, and other radio stations. And what do we get in the 1920s and soon after? Um, new, new new varieties like sports commentary and news reading and weather forecasting and chat shows and so on, uh, expanding what I would call the expressive richness of the language. And the same thing has happened with the internet. So all the new technology that we're using right now, like Facebook and YouTube and all the rest of it, uh, we're seeing new varieties emerging, constrained more by the technological limitations, think short messaging services, for instance, constraining our usage rather than by anything else. But the, the statistics of growth on the internet are just the same, it seems to me, as the statistics of growth that I mentioned earlier on. English is still the dominant language of the internet, um, but uh, uh, growing perhaps not as rapidly as the internet becomes more multilingual. And yet it's too soon to say really what the long-term trends are going to be. 30 years, as you all know, is an, is an eye blink in the, in the history of language. And what might be happening in 50 years time could be very, very different. Now the pandemic arrives. And so one looks to see whether there are any significant changes. And we'll talk about some of that in a moment. Um, I don't see, it's, it's too soon to say what implications there might be statistically uh, and whether, whether we're, go we're going to see something different from what we've already seen on the internet before. So yes, in interesting trends, but no conclusions yet, I don't think. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. It's interesting that we have here specialists from all walks of walks of what from all walks of life and uh, therefore there will be questions uh, r relating to cognitive linguistics to general English status in the world to phonetics and one of the specialists who is, is, uh, who is focusing on words on vocabulary uh, is Professor Natalia Borisovna Grishiani. Natalia Borisovna I'm sure you, you have something to ask uh, Professor Crystal in this connection. Uh, yes thank you very much uh, Professor Crystal so good to see you today thank you very much for joining us and uh, I remember very vividly 
that for the first time we met uh, in 1995 uh, at one of uh, British uh, Council uh, conferences and you were giving a master class. And uh, that was on the future of linguistics and on the future of language studies. Oh, yeah. and, uh, I, I remember you saying that at the turn of the century, uh, language studies are sort of uh, moving uh, beyond their frontiers in the direction of the society uh, uh, at large and in the direction of other disciplines such as sociolinguistics, such as uh, psychology, and uh, that they uh, looked very different from uh, what they were uh, a few decades uh, before. Uh, so uh, uh, the language uh, must be changing uh, as well, although I don't uh, mean any dramatic, any drastic changes. Uh, let's call them potential changes. Uh, and my uh, question is, uh, where do they uh, come from? Where uh, may they come from? Uh, where are they uh, brewing or ripening uh, as well? Is it creative writing, uh, literature? Is it uh, science and technology? Or maybe it's uh, the uh, variety, uh, as you uh, called it right now, the variety of mass media language, or even uh, that of pop culture. So yeah. uh, what is the potential uh, of these uh, varieties uh, in terms of uh, language development? Thank you. That's really a very, very interesting question, Natalia. Thank you. Yes, happy memories of, uh, of those days, indeed. Um, well, what I, we're talking, I suppose, largely about vocabulary here. Uh, yes. There, the, you know, we could talk a little bit about grammar and so on, pronunciation and orthography and so on, but vocabulary is the focus, isn't it? And so what I do here and what I do I mean, virtually every day I go to the OED online, the Oxford mm -hmm. English Dictionary online. To, people say sometimes, uh, if you were on a desert island, what book would you take apart from the Bible and the works of Shakespeare? You know that radio program, <laughs> Desert Island Disc. Um, mm -hmm. And I always say, oh, well, uh, I hope there is an internet connection because I want the, on the online edition of the Oxford English Dictionary. That, that would keep me very, very happy for the, as long as I was on that island. So I look at it most days, and one of the things I do look at is exactly what you're, you're saying. Uh, so where are the new words coming from? And what I find, um, these are impressions, not statistically based, but these mm -hmm. are impressions. Uh, I don't find so much influence of literature these days. Mm -hmm. um, individual authors don't seem to be uh, quite so lexically innovative um, as they used to be, uh, because when you go back to the 19th century, and of course, back as early as Shakespeare, we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of words coming from authors, aren't we? With the one exception of um, global English authors. In other words, writers from the Caribbean, um, mm -hmm. writers from India, and so on, writing in English, writers from other countries, uh, not necessarily ex-Commonwealth countries, writing in English, and therefore introducing into their writing a great deal of localism from their cultural background, you know, local fauna and flora, local myths and legends and all that sort of thing. So there is a certain trend there, but you know, your, your typical British, American, Australian author on the whole is not being so lexically distinctive as perhaps they would have been once upon a time. Science and technology, um, on the whole, the, the Oxford Dictionary and other general dictionaries are not so good at coverage there. The, these, mm -hmm. these terms tend to turn up in specialist dictionaries. So I'm not so aware of, for example, how many new terms have come into physics mm -hmm. or zoology or something. I imagine that continues behind the scenes in the way it always has been, but not much entering into the general uh, uh, lexicon which is what the OED is trying mm. to capture. So uh, we're, uh, we're left with two other trends. Um, one is um, borrowing from other languages. That does seem to have diminished over the past few decades. Uh, there was a mm. huge, you know, borrowing from other languages, as you know, it goes up and down and up and down and up and down over the centuries. 
early Middle English, thousands of words from French, you know, 16th century, thousands of words from Latin and so on. And in the early part of the 20th century, quite a large amount of uh, vocabulary coming in um, from the new nations, uh, especially the newly independent nations. But not so much in recent times. If you look for, you can do this very nicely with the advanced search function in the OED. And you can ask mm -hmm. how many words have come in recently from you know, Nigeria or, or wherever. Uh, and not, not as many as used to be the case. But mm -hmm. English vocabulary is continuing to grow and grow and grow as we know. So where is the new stuff coming from? And it's that last section that you just asked about, the mass mm -hmm. media journalism, pop culture, and so on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the kind of vocabulary that's coming in is on the whole coinages, mm -hmm. uh, like blends of existing words to produce new words. And the evidence is in any new trend. And so what is the obvious trend to look at at the moment is COVID. And you look at all the new COVID vocabulary that's come in. Now, Apart from the technical vocabulary, like lockdown and social distancing and uh, self-isolation and so on, we have this huge um, coinage of well, language play that we can perhaps talk about in a little while. Uh, so people are talking about, you know, COVID idiots and, and COVID dancing and Corona dodging and quarantine becomes quarantine teenies and quarantine total and hundreds of coinages of that kind. Now, how many will have a permanent place in the language? That's an interesting question. We don't know, but there are some studies. John Algio, for instance, a few years ago, did a study of new words that had come into English in the 1970s and found that 75% of the neologisms from the 1970s were no longer known in whenever he did that study in 2000 and something, 2005 or, or around then anyway. So, you know, a significant number of new words don't have a long life, uh, mm -hmm. but on the whole, 25% or so seem to be retained. So English vocabulary oh, is still okay. growing and growing and growing. Mm -hmm. um, mainly, I think, from the popular culture, social media, that side of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a comprehensive answer. Oh, thank you for such a comprehensive question. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what you are speaking about, Professor Crystal, right now is related to, to the question that uh, Professor Vishnikov wanted to ask, because she, her question is dealing with the semiotics of language and the, and, the, and the way modern people actually see the world and how this new vision is reflected in vocabulary and the way they think and the way they speak. So I give the floor to Olga Vishnikova. She, she was thinking of asking the question. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Crystal. Hello. It's, of course, a great pleasure for all of us to see you here and to take part in this discussion as, as well. And uh, thank you very much. My and pleasure. my question is about abbreviation in the English mm. language. And as we all know, the process of abbreviation is determined by various factors, both linguistic and non-linguistic and is closely connected with the principle of linguistic economy, mm. as some people state. And at the same time, the abbreviation process deals with certain rethinking or interpretation of the reality itself by means of language. And uh, one of the most interesting problems that arise in this connection is interrelation of an encoding and decoding issues in terms of semiotic and cognitive characteristics. And to my mind, the most uh, important thing as well is to what extent abbreviation influences not only the communicative behavior of members of the society, but also the structure and development of language system. Mm. And this is actually what I would like to ask you about. Mm. Thank you. Fa absolutely fas fascinating um, topic. Abbreviation. Yes, indeed. You're quite right. Abbreviation has two functions. The, the, the function of economy that you mentioned is absolutely central. 
um, and and then there is the function of of group identity or group solidarity, which raises the broader issue. Um, people are more likely to use abbreviations if they belong to the same uh, well cultural background, but also specialist background or professional background. We all you know we all have our abbreviations in linguistics, which will not be understood by anybody outside, and and so it, so it goes on. So those two forces drive the use of abbreviation and abbreviation then gets a critical press, doesn't it? When it, when these specialized abbreviations are used often without thinking um, in, a, in a broader context, hugely criticized um, behavior when either they're overused or they're used without a sense of audience. And this is where I think behavior and behavioral change um, is taken into account. Uh, for me, the notion of abbreviation isn't just restricted to individual words, though. Um, uh, th th that's an important aspect. I, I like to s talk about abbreviation in the broader sense, abbreviating, because when we're talking cognitively, I, I think, you know, words have to belong to sentences. That's what sentences are for, in my view. Sentences exist to make sense of words. Words by themselves do not make sense in, in my conception of things. Words by themselves are hugely ambiguous. Um, so take the word table. I say table, what does it mean? Uh, well, it, dep it depends. It, it could be a piece of furniture. It could be a diagram in a book. It could be a mountain in South Africa. It could be all sorts of things. Uh, so make sense of it, put it in context, you say to me. Uh, well, that means put it in a sentence. So as soon as I put it in a sentence, then the sentence selects the sense. And, you know, I, there is a, something wrong with the leg of the table or there is a correction needed in the third row of the table and so on. Now, therefore, an, an individual abbreviation might or might not make sense um, on, on its own. It could be quite ambiguous. Indeed, I don't know whether you've got this book in your library. Uh, I have downstairs here. It has to be downstairs because it's so big, I couldn't carry it upstairs. Uh, it's five volumes, Gale's Dictionary of Acronyms, Abbreviations, and Initialisms by the American company, publishing company, Gale, G-A-L-E, Gale. Uh, and this is five volumes of all the abbreviations they collected at that time. And there's half a million abbreviations in there. And every time I come across an abbreviation, I look it up to see if it's in Gale. And it usually isn't uh, because they didn't, they couldn't cover everything um, and they didn't. And of course, new abbre abbreviations have come in. So you go to look up any one abbreviation and immediately you see whatever it is, you think BBC, uh, that means the broadcasting company in England. Uh, well, no, not only that, BBC has 10 or 12 interpretations. Well, you, we see this on Google, don't we? You type in an abbreviation into Google and suddenly you get all sorts of things coming up there. So we need sentences uh, in order to um, interpret the abbreviations that are individual words. And so I go now to the context where abbreviation is taking place at the moment. And what do I see? I see once again, uh, the internet playing an absolutely crucial role here insofar as uh, cognitive behavior is altering in context of abbreviation. I look once again at the short messaging services, the SMS services. I look at Twitter, for instance, which was constrained, you remember, originally to 160 characters, 140 characters, Twitter, 160 characters in text messaging. You remember things like that uh, doubled now. And the constraint of a short messaging service immediately fo forces you to introduce strategies of abbreviation that you would not normally uh, wish to uh, introduce into one's written communication or even less into one's spoken communication. So whereas you and I in a chat would be say, using all the well, comment clauses, for instance, as Quirk calls them, the Quirk grammar calls them, things like, you know, you see, I mean, mind you, trouble is, frankly speaking, and all of those. Mm -hmm. These are typically absent in um, short messaging services. Uh, 
there is a great deal more elliptical construction than you'd normally expect to see. And of course, a great deal of uh, LOLs and all the, you know, the texting abbreviations that are there simply because the space constraint forces you to use them. Now, this is immediately affecting uh, some, uh, I'm out of my depth here now because this is more a question for psychologists and sociologists to answer. But the psycholinguists that I've read uh, on this topic are saying that this is beginning to affect the way in which uh, young people in particular, but in a sense, all of us, um, are thinking about how we structure our, our messages. And indeed, talking to my children and especially to my grandchildren, I sense this, uh, the, the elliptical short sentence way in which my grandson Matteo talks to me um, is very typically internet speak in, in many ways. It's not that he can't do longer sentences and a longer monologue of sorts. He can do this very well. I've heard him do it in school. His teachers say he can give a report on a book that is as um, monologue-like as any of us could do. But in everyday chat, his conversation is much more elliptical than I think mine would have been at his age and perhaps yours too. So in that broader sense of abbreviation, I am beginning to see some trends. It's a fascinating area of research and, and I hope more gets done in it. I haven't done any first-hand research myself, so my remarks have to remain fairly general, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. And you see, this is the book that inspired me working on <laughs> abbreviations, on texting, on electronic correspondence. Oh, <laughs> texting. Thank now, that is, a, that is now Thank historical you. linguistics in some ways. Uh, no, texting. no. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, li 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 listen, listen to this, um, Olga. I, I, in the days when I was allowed to go out, um, I used to go to schools quite a lot. And one of the things I would do in schools with these A-level students, advanced level students, so we're talking about 16, 17 year old students, I would ask them to uh, get a collection of their texts together so that we could analyze them and see what was going on. And in the old days, they would do this and there'd be lots of abbreviations, exactly like the ones I mentioned in my book. I went into a school last year, where are we now? Yes, last the end of 2019 and asked them to do the same exercise. And listen, there wasn't a single abbreviation to be seen in their texts. So I asked them why? And they looked at me as if I was from a different planet. Uh, and they said, well, because they're not cool anymore. You know, the, the young kids use them, they said, said these 16 year olds, the, the, young, the young kids <laughs> use them. And indeed, 10 year olds and 11 year olds find the novelty of this fascinating and they use them a lot. But these 16, 17 year olds didn't use them at all. Um, oh, apart from the very frequent ones like U for U and C for C, S W E, you know, one or two. And LOL, of course, has uh, la uh, laughing out loud, has retained its, its frequency. Apart from that, none. And one lad came up to me and summed it all up. He said to me, I'll tell you when I stopped abbreviating. He said, I stopped when my dad started. <laughs> Do you get it? In other words, when old people steal young people's slang, it is no longer cool to use that slang anymore. And so there has been a marked decrease in the number of abbreviations, at least in Britain. Now, you know, we could look at it in, in other countries and the figures might be different. Um, but in the UK, uh, that's why I say my book is historical linguistics, because it no longer represents the young people as they are right now. There has been a significant change and not so many abbreviations. On the shelves behind me, I have a, uh, a tiny little book which came out in 2005, just after the peak of abbreviating in texting, as I was writing that book that you showed. And it's got 600 abbreviations in there. Well, only about 5% of those abbreviations la lasted to the present day. 
And of those 5%, only a tiny number, I think, are actually still in some sort of use. As I say, the situation may be different in, in, in Russia, I don't know, but in Britain, it's, they seem to be dying out a bit. Well, so it's unfashionable. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So, so, so many things actually to say about how, how we understand each other's words and phrases and so on and so forth, but there is also the front door, the phonetics, the way we speak, the way we pronounce things. Uh, and I'm sure Professor Svetlana Dicheva will have something to ask in this respect. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to everyone present here and especially to the organizers of this conference for this unique opportunity of getting us all together so that we could share our linguistic concerns, express our ideas. And for me, it is a special privilege and an honor uh, to raise some phonetic questions uh, uh, and discuss them with Professor Crystal. Um, the first question which I would like to raise uh, deals with the innovative tendencies in modern English uh, pronunciation and speaking culture, perhaps in general. The fact is that uh, nowadays teaching phonetics, especially to non-native students, is an extremely challenging task. Um, everybody thinks that they're given, as it were, a free hand uh, um, and what uh, kind of pronunciation they use. And there are no strings actually attached to the e dialect they use or to the idiosyncrasies of their uh, phonetics and uh, style, phonetic style of speech. Uh, mm. In fact, uh, under the pressure of globalization, democratization, the unprecedented growth of technological um, um, gadgets of different kind, and especially with the arrival on the scene of the new uh, digital natives, as people call them, the young generation of learners, uh, things change dramatically. Uh, unfortunately, however, fortunately perhaps, I don't know, uh, um, uh, students, Oh, of course, have absolutely different requisites for communicative efficacy and uh, what used to be regarded as uh, uh, traditional and acceptable in the times when I was a student is no longer what they expect from the teachers and lecturers at the university. Uh, sometimes uh, with the um, incredible permissiveness in the atmosphere of general permissiveness in phonetics, uh, they start to suffer from the worst kind of uh, phonetic indigestion, which, if you ask me, hampers communication a great deal and sometimes may even lead to um, all kind of mutual incomprehension and misunderstanding perhaps as well. So my question is, um, what's your idea of modern English speaking culture? Does it actually exist? Uh, has it changed since um, uh, the so-called prehistoric, pre-internet, prehistoric, pre-internet times? And what are the main criteria of um, um, the what of something which can be described as cultured or cultivated? English speech these days. Hmm. Gosh, yes. Of course, the criterion is intelligibility. I mean, that, that is the bottom line. We cannot get away from that. That is the whole point of pronunciation, that, that we should be mutually intelligible. What has happened is that the other force there are two many forces drive language. One is the force for intelligibility. We need to understand each other. Uh, secondly, the force for identity. We need to express who we are and where we're from, which fosters the growth of different languages, different dialects and different accents in particular, which is at the background here. And there are other forces too, such as the force for uh, 
um, entertainment and play, language play, which we can again talk about. Uh, but let's focus on the identity issue because that is the one that is most prominently present and causing the tension uh, that you're talking about here. Um, people want to emulate, the young people in particular want to emulate, they accommodate, you know, you all know the notion of accommodation from social linguistics, and they're much more ready to accommodate to other people's uh, ways of uh, talking and indeed, and of course, writing too, um, than maybe it used to be the case. Um, so global culture variation has been the main factor in speeding up this process, it seems to me. Now, I can't, I think it's impossible to generalize about the world as a whole here, uh, because different cult countries are so different in the way in which the global factors ha have come to be influential. But take Britain as the case in point, where the main change in young people's speech has undoubtedly been the effect of uh, global culture variation. Um, th the fact that there are so many cultural communities, you know, multi-ethnic Britain, as it's called, a multicultural Britain. Uh, do you remember, some of you will know, there was a study on what is called multicultural London English mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, one of the first big study of its kind and the factors that came out of that uh, showed very clearly that among young people, uh, instead of the incomers accommodating to the norms of the young people indigenous to this country, it was the other way around, that the, the young East London speakers, the Cockney speakers of old, uh, were adapting their speech um, to, uh, to take on board the, the characteristics of the incomers. And the main effect uh, has been on, on, on rhythm, um, as, as uh, has been most frequently pointed out. Not so much on the vowels and the consonants. Uh, they always change a little bit, but the rhythmical differences are really quite striking now. You go to the East End, and, and by the way, no longer just the East End. I have heard this kind of speech uh, locally here in Wales, um, and... I, if I was still traveling around, I'm quite sure I would see it, hear it in places like Liverpool and Leeds and, and so on. And it is the influence of syllable timed um, rhythm on the originally stressed timed rhythm of English. So the, you know, in, in popular terms, the tum ti tum ti tum ti tum sort of rhythm of, of yes. English and in yes. many languages, uh, compared with the rat -a tat 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 kind of rhythm that you get with syllable kind languages like, like French, Spanish. Uh, and now you see from some of these new varieties of English around the English speaking world. So uh, typically Indian English is very syllable kind. Uh, you know, the consequences of what I am saying, the rat -tat 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 -tat. Uh, South African English is very syllable kind. Uh, South Africa, South Africa. Uh, and crucially, Caribbean English is syllable timed, you know, Jamaica, Jamaica, rat tat tat. And it's the language of the Caribbean with its rap and its hip hop and all those popular trends that has crossed the Atlantic and got into British culture and probably in, into young Russian culture as well. I wouldn't be surprised at all because uh, I've heard it also in French and in Spanish and in Dutch. Um, people are rapping in these languages uh, in a very similar syllable timed way. So now you get the following effect that you go to the East End of London and uh, somebody there might say, the young chap might say, um, me, me and my mates are going down to the garage this evening. Now in, in a Cockney version, it would be me and my mates are going down to the garage this evening. rat a -ti tum ti tum ti tum ti tum ti tum and now I'm hearing things like, me and my mates, we are going down to the garage this evening. Me and my mates, rat tat 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 tat. And that is, uh, the recordings I've heard from the Multicultural Project, so many of the kids are now naturally speaking like this. So that I think is the main cultural um, influence. Uh, now, is it making it unintelligible? 
if speed is included in the equation, yes, it does get very difficult to, not by them, they're understanding each other fine, of course, uh, but by anybody who isn't used to that. It's the same with, with Indian English. Um, do you remember a period when call centers uh, were, were outsourced to India uh, rather than from the UK? And you would ring up, you, you would call up a call center to ask for advice and the speech Indian English with its, its syllable timing. If the person spoke slowly, it was perfectly clear. If they spoke rapidly, it was unintelligible. So I think factors like speed and rhythm are far more important than, than anything else. And that I think is the main influence on, on modern English speaking culture. Though how far it is widespread around the world, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, in relation to the other points you mentioned, um, the new online communities that are oral rather than graphic are still in a minority, thinking of things like YouTube uh, and the like, and, and some of the other oral uh, chatty social media. Very little research done on this now. Lovely area of research here. I've not done it. Um, my impression is that there are new speech communities there that have, have, just like they adopted with, with written communication, new graphic forms, new graphic dialects, shall we call them. So I am beginning to hear new uh, accents. Well, accents is perhaps the wrong word. It, it, it's bigger than that. Uh, a, a new styles of speaking, uh, which include an accent. And the evidence that this is becoming increasingly popular is in the, uh, the companies that are now spending an awful lot of money trying to decide what accents to give their robots, uh, for example. Uh, we all listen to Alexa and Siri and things like that. I mean, I don't listen routinely and I never ask Alexa any serious questions, uh, uh -huh. but I only really ask, ask questions in order to see how she's speaking these days. And uh, I've been the consultant on one or two projects where the issue has been, what accent do we give to our, to our uh, um, robots? There was a lovely study a few years ago in New Zealand um, where the a medical study, where the three kinds of accent were presented, New Zealand English, uh, in a robotic way, New Zealand English, um, British English, and American English. And advice was given about a medical condition. And the participants were asked to say, well, which of the three accents did they believe? And the answer was, of course, as you might expect, New Zealand people expect, uh, believed the, the advice of the New Zealand robot. And second, they believed the advice of the British robot and hardly any of them believed the advice of the American robot. <laughs> now make what you will of that. <laughs> but this I think is the area where we're getting a lot of change compared with pre-internet times uh, to, to do with the, the placing the, the selection and placing of accents. And anything else, anything else I can think of in culture in relation to academic settings? Main change here, I suspect, is more a stylistic one rather than an accent one, or rather than an articulatory one. Uh, you know, the new um, morality that's out there, the culture of offense, as people call it. Very difficult now for us, isn't it, when we're giving a lecture uh, in any language, um, but I've only known, studied English, which, which words are we no longer able to use without the risk that somebody is going to complain about them? You know, that, that is the biggest area. It hasn't yet affected pronunciation particularly, unless you're on the BBC, uh, in which case, if you use a certain pronunciation, you might get a post bag full of complaints, <laughs> don't you? Uh, so there are all these trends and influences so also recent, so a lovely area of research for any of you students out there who are wondering what to write your thesis on. It's a perfect area, I think. Sorry, I give long answers to short Thank questions. Thank you very much. Oh, and with your permission, I have another question, which is closely connected with what you have just said. 
don't you think that uh, the process of distance learning and language teaching as well is in a class by itself in phonetic terms. You know, quite a few people uh, find, you know, for example, the process of delivering a lecture in the internet quite attractive mm. because there is no need any longer to prepare, uh, to um, rehearse it millions of times mm. and you simply read. Uh, the ready-made text. Quite a few uh, language consultants and uh, coaches in uh, public speaking believe that uh, there's nothing wrong about it these days. Mm. They don't mind uh, public speakers reading the text. Mm. The only recommendation is that you should read it as if you were speaking. Mm. So uh, what about the simulation of reading uh, um, if it is th the main uh, a requisite of uh, uh, conducting a lecture in the internet. Mm. Uh, what would it be? Uh, um, how can we classify it in terms of rhythm, audibility, uh, speed, and all the rest of those prosodic parameters? Yes, uh, very, very interesting. Yes, so, uh, people are doing a lot of reading. They're also doing a lot of spontaneous lecturing, though, as well. Um, and that is a bigger problem uh, because you lack the simultaneous feedback from your audience to let you know how you're doing. Um, so I am speaking to you now spontaneously. I am not reading anything. Uh, if I say something, I do not know what you feel about that because I cannot see your feedback. I mean, I can generally, but there's a lag. And so the feedback might be delayed a little bit. And I can't look at any everybody anyway. You are all on, on different boxes. So, so I ignore all your mm -hmm. facial expressions and body language and so on. But you're not, because you're all muted, giving me the usual simultaneous feedback that I would expect. So you're not going, uh-huh, yeah, mm-hmm, mm, no, oh, really? Oh, no, mm, what? And things like that. That is what makes an everyday conversation so successful, that though that simultaneous feedback is there. But it also is what makes a face-to-face -face lecture so successful, because you look at the audience, you look at your students, and you get a sense immediately of how they're responding to, to, to how you're dealing with things. So... Lack of feedback immediately means changes in style because you know that there is not going to be feedback. You take account of it in some way and you don't, for example, use as many rhetorical questions, for instance. Uh, is that OK? Mm. Uh, well, I, I don't know if it's OK or not, you know, because I can't tell what, whether it is. Whereas an audience might respond with, with a nod or a clap or whatever it might be. So yes, things are changing and are affecting style. Oh, another big research area here. I do tend to, th my impression, I've not researched this. My impression is that there has been a general slowing down mm -hmm. unless you get very used to it. I'm very used to it now. I'm on Zoom almost every day of the week these days. I'm speaking at probably my normal speaking rate. Um, now. What is a normal speaking rate? Now, this is where the phonetics research is so important, isn't it? Uh, I'm sp uh, measured in syllables per minute is the usual mm -hmm. criterion, not words per minute. Any students out there, don't try and judge speed in terms of words because words are different lengths. Uh, but syllables tend to be the easiest way. So I'm speaking now at a rate of about 250 syllables a minute. Mm -hmm. and that's my normal speaking rate. If I were, and by, by the way, let's contrast that now with reading the news on Radio 4. Good evening. This is David Crystal reading the news on Radio 4. Now today, something important has happened in the world. This is 200 syllables a minute. If we go down to 150 syllables a minute, it is going to sound something like this. It is going to be very boring after a while. So one doesn't want to slow down to this rate. But 200 syllables a minute is a perfectly respectable reading style. And so I do tend to find, to hear people using that kind of style. Now, if I were to speak at 200 syllables a minute, 
for you all now this morning. A, it would take our session three times as long to get into all the answers to the questions, and I think it would become a little boring after a while. So my advice to Zoom lecturers is to try and maintain your normal, comfortable speaking rate as best you can, simply in order to maintain interest on the part of uh, your, your listening audience. Bearing in mind that that listening audience is now no longer constrained, unless you're in a, a special setting where you have set parameters. I do not know now uh, who is listening to me or where they are from or which country they are from sometimes with a Zoom conversation, isn't it? And, and therefore, you have, to, you have to take care and speak perhaps a little more slowly. But that doesn't, is not so much a phonetic question in my mind as a question of culture. When I'm talking on a Zoom chat and I don't know the audience, I tend not to use so many local cultural expressions from a British English culture as I would if I were speaking to an audience of English students. Uh, make, let, make less reference to British things, for instance. Perhaps not use so many idioms from cricket, for instance, and things like this, uh, simply because I'm talking to an anonymous audience, really. And not only are there new listening skills and new rate, skills of rate, uh, but I think there are also skills of cultural expectation which have to be taken into account as well. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you for yeah. the most informative and interesting discussion for your answers. We'll certainly use them in our future phonetic studies and analyze it in greater detail. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Svetlana. And, and, you know, lots of lovely research just waiting to be done here, isn't there? <laughs> Thank you. Professor Crystal, there, was, there is a, uh, another area of, in of interest among my colleagues here is about what is teachable and what is not teachable. And uh, here, Margarita Mikhailovna Filipova uh, wanted to ask you about something that she thinks is quite difficult to teach in the modern context. Oh, so, right. Margarita. Uh, hello. Um, hello, Professor Crystal. It's uh, an extreme pleasure to uh, see you and to be able to talk to you. And my question is about um, language play. Ah. Um, uh, oh, you... hooray! <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, um, fa my favorite subject. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, language play and humor, it's something wonderful. It's something which distinguishes uh, the English culture or the British culture from, from others. And um, this is um, a wonderful book. Uh, I, I just love it. And my question is about uh, how do we introduce um, language play and humor into the teaching process, into the mm. teaching process, and uh, whether there are certain stages at which it is appropriate, uh, or uh, whether we should do it always, and if so, how do we, uh, uh, you know, guarantee comprehension, and also uh, whether it is possible to, to do linguistic research, actually, serious linguistic research of uh, uh, English humor and language play. Mm, thank you. Yes. Oh, lovely, Margarita. What an <coughs> interesting topic. Uh, first thing I would want to point out, though, uh, to the audience generally, um, who may not have seen th this book at all, uh, is that language play is much bigger than humor. Humor is just one aspect of language play. And in fact, quantifying it, I never have done, but I would suspect that most instances of language play are not humorous at all. Um, I mean, take the uh, Covidiot coinages we talked about a little while ago. Uh, these are there not particularly for humorous purposes. They're there to express a kind of creative urge to be innovative and different and, and to make a pun and so on. Most puns, as we know, are not especially funny, but they, they, they elicit a groan rather than a laugh. Um, and when I uh, was uh, writing language play, I remember thinking, yes, humor is a very important part, but it's not by any means the, the only thing. Language play also includes things like Scrabble and crossword puzzles 
and things of that kind. Now, these are not humorous things, but they are playful things. We play with language in all kinds of contexts like that. So uh, the question in relation to teaching is, of course, one of, of grading and uh, where in the syllabus do you put this kind of thing? Now, the research that I find most useful in relation to this is the field of child language acquisition. Um, because uh, Language play has been a big subject there. You'll find many papers in, for example, the Journal of Child Language on this subject. And the reason is that language play is part of language acquisition from the very beginning, from birth. Children are exposed to language play in the form, first of all, of uh, caretaker speech, the, uh, the, the nonsense speech that we use to little babies. Um, yes. the, the baby is born. I, I used to spend some time, once upon a time, when I was studying child language in maternity wards, for instance. Um, and there would be a newly born baby, uh, and of course the mother, naturally, uh, and sometimes the father, if the father had not fainted away, uh, and sometimes a nurse and, and a doctor and a midwife and so on. And my, my role, I'd been with full permission, of course, was to record the interaction between the adults in the room and the baby. And the, the language, of course, is extremely playful. It, it is not uh, intellectual. We do not greet a newborn baby uh, with, you know, uh, hello, baby, you are a newly born baby. Uh, welcome to the world. This is a hospital. That is your mother. Here is your father. This is a doctor. We don't see, no, we say things like, and this is now a quotation from my recordings. Oh, you lovely little baby then. You are gorgeous baby. Yes, you are lovely. You are lovely. Oh, yes, you are. You are. You are. And so on and so forth. So the baby from the very beginning is being exposed to a world of language play. And when you actually now go through the first year of life, and this has been very well studied, only about 10% of the language input to a first year of life child is, as it were, intellectual, is, is objective, is, is denotative. It's all playful. Um, in one form or another, much more sophisticated than the, what I just did, but, you know, nonetheless, it's there. And so it doesn't take long uh, before the, that kind of play transfers to the child himself or herself. So when you start now recording early usage by children, uh, of course, in the second year of life, the words and so on tend to be uh, pr pretty, you know, words like daddy and mummy and boy and girl and dog and all that. But by the time the child is two, and certainly in the third year of life, they are beginning to play with language by themselves. And how are they playing? And this is where one can get a sense of growth, a sense of grading. They're first of all playing with very simple phonetic variations. Um, I've got a recording where one child, this is a two and a half year old, playing with another of the same age. And one child is saying, um, this airplane, this, this plane's got wings. It's got wingos. It's got wingo, wingos. And the other child then says, it's got wingo, dingo, ringos. It's got singo, tingos. And they start bouncing sounds off each other like that in that way. So a sort of basic phonetic play is there, or perhaps phonological play is there. And then they start, they can play with grammar and they can play with vocabulary and so on. And as you get older, you sense a greater sophistication in the type of play that the young children can cope with. So now I've got a recording of a six. I saw this in my family. You might see it in yours. It was the case that at one point I had a, uh, a five-year-old and a seven-year-old in my house. And they were watching on television a, a cartoon program of a certain kind. The seven-year-old was laughing away at the jokes that were being made. And the five-year-old was looking at the seven-year-old and saying, basically, why is that funny? Uh, and the seven-year-old was saying, shut up, I'm watching the cartoon, shut up. And the five-year-old saying, but I want to know why you're laughing. And there was a lovely row breaking out, you see, because between five and seven, there is a huge variation in the, in the sophistication of the humor that young children can accept. 
In particular, the seven-year-old was beginning to realize that there were such things as puns and wordplay of that kind. Five-year-old is not up to that stage yet. You know the kind of joke I mean. I don't know whether you have this in Russian, but in English there are books called A Thousand Jokes for Kids. And they are awful jokes, terrible jokes. And if you buy one, then you have, as an adult, as a parent, you have to wait while the child says, you know, knock, knock, who's there? You know, that, and you think, oh. And then they tell this joke in a very deadpan kind of way. And then you have to simulate laughter as a parent in order to reinforce the joke. And a seven-year-old is now making jokes of the kind, when is a door not a door? Answer, when it's ajar. The joke is A-J-A-R, meaning slightly open, versus J-A-R, meaning a container for jam or something. So when is a door not a door? When it's a jar. Seven-year-olds are beginning to laugh at this sort of thing. Eight-year-olds, definitely. Six-year-olds, sorry, don't understand. Uh, partly because they don't know the word ajar. Uh, but, you know, similar sorts of jokes um, where the words would be very familiar. Again, so, so to get back to the question, um, there are indeed age-related developments uh, in language play. Uh, to take an example from uh, grammar, or perhaps it's lexicon or a bit of both, uh, the use of similes. Uh, gr there are stages in development here. Uh, there was a research study where the researcher presented children with the expression, this um, object was as big as, and now the child has to finish off the sentence. Four-year-olds would say, as big as big, repeating, you see, very simple kind of thing. Uh, Six-year-olds would say, as big as a mountain. Uh, Eight-year-olds would say, as big as the world, or so, you know, it, very physical kinds of things. But when you get to about age sort of nine and 10, the similes start to become much more literary. Uh, I remember one example, um, how big was this? And the child, the 10 year old said, as big as an ice cream cornet in a baby's hand, which is poetic, you know? And they're starting to develop that kind of imaginative simile. So again, you see my point, there are gradations here. So teaching this, ha ha, here's the cop out, here's the uh, excuse. I am not a teacher. I don't have to teach these things in class. I have the easy job. I'm just a linguist here. So I don't know the answer to the question. Um, when and how do you introduce these things into the classroom? All I would say, though, was that the language acquisition perspective teaches us that the earlier the better, and that there's nothing wrong with introducing some element of language play from the very beginning, from lesson one, day one in English teaching, or whatever the language is. But it has to be obviously very, very simple. And it might simply be a reflection of the kind of language play you get in the cartoons that young children watch. And what is that? Well, there are many things, but the one that immediately comes to my mind is different tones of voice uh, and different voice qualities. Uh, what you see in a cart, what you hear in a cartoon, the characters speak in very funny ways. Uh, think Donald Duck, think Mickey Mouse, Think Goofy, uh, all those characters and the different voices that they have. Now, young children from as early as age three are able to start to pick up different voice qualities in that way. And they will put on different tones of voice. All parents know this uh, when they're playing with their dolls. Suddenly you hear your voice in the voice of the doll, uh, the mummy's voice and the daddy's voice. And even with different languages, you begin to see them coming alive there. So from the very beginning, I see no harm at all in having, say, uh, the very first lesson, which is how you say good morning or how you say good day or how you say my name is David or whatever the first lesson is doing in English teaching. 
then yes, that's the way we're teaching it. We're teaching it in now. Back to the other question, we're teaching it perhaps in received pronunciation or general American or whatever the accent is you're teaching. Uh, and the child is learning or the student is learning to uh, say that sentence in a certain way. Then why not at the end say, well, yes, that's the way I say it. That's the way uh, the accent I'm teaching you. That's the dialect I'm teaching you. But by the way, how would an American say it? Uh, and, you know, uh, my, my name is, uh, uh, I, I drive a car. An American would say, I drive a car. Uh, or something, or, uh, and a Scots person would say, I drive a car, uh, and just give them that listening comprehension awareness, which is done for playful reasons. You're still teaching them the main accent, and the main dialect, and the standard language, and so on, but in listening comprehension terms, they're becoming aware that the English language is now very varied out there. They're going to learn one style, that's what you're going to teach them, but you're giving them practice in this listening domain uh, which starts, starts simply and then build up into a language play later, more sophisticatedly. Oh, another long answer. Sorry. No, it's a... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. Actually, I have two, two more questions, but I don't know if Martlian will allow me to, to ask them. Are, are we all right for time, Martlian? No, no, no. If, it's, if it's okay with you. Uh, oh, yes, I'm fine. I'm, okay. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not allowed to go anywhere. <laughs> ben, Margarita, you, you, you just you carry on with your questions. So let's... Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the, the answer to the previous question. The next question is about uh, your attitude to the politically uh, correct, uh, uh, to the political correctness movement. And actually, it seems to me that we can contrast it with uh, the Black Lives Matter <laughs> movement mm. to extent. And um, uh, in connection with it, I remember um, Kenneth Hudson saying that um, any uh, roughness on the part of the language, just like any kind of gentility, it makes the language weaker. And so what do you think, how should we navigate between these two extremes? Mm. Oh, I wish I knew. Yeah, <laughs> this is really tricky, isn't it? Weaker, I don't know about weaker. Uh, it's certainly there are signs of a, a, a reduction. The point I made a little while ago about being sensitive to offensiveness and things like that. That is certainly reducing the range of lexical options that is available to us, um, at least in public circumstances. But it's too early to say what any long-term effect might be. This um, uh, political correctness, of course, has been around for decades now, uh, since the 1970s at least. Uh, and earlier forms too, but you know, the dominant one with feminism and so on. And there are so many different domains now where people are being sensitive, some people say unduly sensitive uh, to what is happening out there. The problem is essentially one of the internet once again. Once upon a time, if I was talking to a group of students, or to a small group of people. I would know them, they would know me, we all know who we are. Uh, and I would have a sense of what might be offensive. We develop this very quickly as we grow up. Teen this is the teenage years learning, uh, especially. You develop a sense of what's offensive. You learn there are certain topics that you don't deal with um, unless you know the people very, very well. You know, topics like religion and politics. You keep off that at the dinner table unless you really know the people that you're with. Um, and when you know your audience, when you know your readership, uh, then you, you feel that you can fly linguistically uh, and, and be spontaneous and so on. And the risk of causing a difficulty is, it's always there, but it's pretty remote. And with simultaneous feedback, you can correct the point straight away. Uh, if I say something uh, and, and I've inadvertently offended you and I'm talking to you face to face, you can say, hang on a minute. 
uh, and oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean it like that, and resolve the tension. But online, where we don't know how many people are there, then, then the degree to which compla the complaint tradition manifests itself becomes increasingly apparent. And this has been noted and to some extent studied now uh, in Twitter. Uh, Twitter, when it began, was uh, a very, well, like all the internet, social media, everybody thought they were going to be wonderful things. It's going to make everybody happy and talk to each other. And we're all going to love each other more. And it's the freedom of information and all of that. Well, there was a program, a uh, television program recently with the guys who started the internet were reflecting on what a disaster um, it has been and, and the downside and how they never expected it to take off in the way it has. So these days, I hardly ever, I, I had a Twitter account from the very beginning. I hardly ever use it now. And when I do, it's only to, uh, uh, to report a piece of news. I never now give an opinion on Twitter for two reasons. One is, the shortness that we talked about earlier means that you can't express the nuances that you need in order to make your opinion clear. And secondly, even if you do find yourself able to make a succinct statement that uh, you think is inoffensive, somebody will take offense at it for reasons that were beyond your comprehension when you began. And people have started to quantify the amount of abuse and uh, expressions of disquiet, and it has shot up over the last five years on, on Twitter. So many people now are saying, I don't want to use Twitter anymore, uh, or at least only for certain minimalist uh, purposes. Same thing is applying on Facebook and uh, Snapchat and TikTok and, and all the others. There is a novelty which is producing tremendous uh, effect and then a reaction to that novelty as the, well, you know, the assumption of the internet was everybody in the world is actually quite nice. It turns out that everybody in the world is actually quite nasty, or at least a sufficient number of them to mean that anything you say is likely to be taken down, as the lawyers say, and used in evidence against you. So, hmm, that, that novelty is, how long will it last? There are already signs of a reaction to the reaction, as it were. Uh, some technological companies are now monitoring and excluding in a way they were not a year ago. People are learning that there are certain things that they should and should not do. People are listening more uh, to what other people are saying and doing and reacting to that. So the Black Lives Matter movement, for instance, has been very influential in that respect. I think most of us have learned far more about race over the last year than we ever knew before. My son, Ben, who is an actor and theatre guy, or at least he used to be when the theatres were open, uh, but now spending a lot of time uh, working online with theatre groups around the world, and one of the big things he's concerned about is uh, racial stereotyping on, on the stage, how it affects, how it affects characterization and interaction. What dare one do on stage now? Romeo and Juliet. A black Romeo and a white Juliet or a white Romeo and a black Juliet. And when they meet for the first time, they kiss and the dominance relationships of color affecting the nature of that interaction. You can sense the sensitivities that could come out of the woodwork here, let alone a color-based play like Othello or something of that kind. So uh, all of this is, is uh, out there. And how do I generalize based on those anecdotes I've just given? First of all, it's impossible to generalize across countries. Countries are so different. If you try to make a generalization for several countries, you need to have a great deal of political will. And even then it doesn't work as the European Union has discovered. 
So even in a European Union situation where everybody supposedly, I exclude Britain now, I'm afraid, unfortunately, uh, where everybody supposedly is singing to the same hymn sheet, uh, as they say, uh, there are huge problems. I was at a conference in Brussels uh, a little while ago, well, years ago now, three or four years ago, uh, to talk about the uh, Euro-English, the style that the European Union should use in its uh, conferences, in its online exchanges. The interpreters and the translators were there and they could not agree uh, on the, the scenarios that would be the linguistic scenarios that were needed. There was no unity whatsoever, depending upon the cultural background, the country background, the language background of the participants and the personalities involved. I mean, when you think of it this way, if you're interpreting and, and a, uh, the, the minister from the Netherlands makes a joke, what do you do? It's a joke that only people in the Netherlands might understand. You understand it. So do you now translate the joke into something more neutral that other countries will understand in English? Or do you reflect exactly what the, uh, the, the minister said in the Netherlands so, so that you, you represent him accurately, but not necessarily intelligibly to elsewhere? There was huge debate about this. And some ministers are hugely insistent that you translate exactly what I say. And other ministers say, no, make it more general. And the weight, the responsibility on the interpreters and the translators is enormous here. And this is what the discussion was all about in Brussels that day. So when you can't get even agreement within a, a cluster of countries that are supposedly working so intimately together, uh, I, I never therefore generalize. Uh, about this situation uh, across the world. First point. Second point, the thing I do sense as a result of the internet, but also before the internet came along, is a much greater respect for all languages and dialects and accents, which certainly wasn't around in the 1970s and 80s. Um, I mean, obviously it was in our culture, in the linguistic culture, I'm talking, talking generally. Uh, a much greater respect, acceptance of the fact that there is linguistic diversity, uh, realization, awareness that there are so many languages in the world and so many people are bilingual. You know, th th three quarters of the world's population is probably bilingual, they say. Half the world's population is probably trilingual. In Africa, five languages, perfectly normal here and there. Respect for all languages, Respect for all dialects within a country, which again, certainly was not the case once upon a time. And respect, and we're back to phonetics now, of course, Olga, uh, respect for all accents uh, within a country, which again, was certainly not the case once upon a time. Even though some accents are, as it were, more important uh, than others in terms of teaching and so on, nonetheless, not disrespecting the accents that are not being used in the classroom and elsewhere. So I sense that, and I sense it especially in the area of endangered languages. Uh, remember that the research, the Oxford Handbook of Endangered Languages was published two years ago, uh, or three years ago now, and there was a review of the world situation in relation to endangered languages. And the conclusion was that something like half the world's endangered languages are now likely to become extinct this century. Uh, and an endangered language is becoming extinct on average every three months, which is a bit better than the figure that was being cited in the 1990s, which was every two weeks. But still, it's still a pretty serious scenario. Now, countries uh, are beginning to recognize this. The United Nations has recognized this. UNESCO has recognized this. And individual countries are now doing something to, well, first of all, document and then possibly uh, revitalize some of the local indigenous languages that are most in danger. And in this world, the first thing that has happened is that people look to see how other countries are doing it. So you look to see what has happened in, well, here is Wales where I'm speaking now, where Welsh is an endangered language, but a very successfully revitalized one. The numbers of people speaking Welsh is growing at the moment. 
So people look to countries like Wales and to uh, 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 Barcelona, uh, Cat the Catalan uh, speaking areas of Spain and things like that to see how the successful nations, nations have carried out these tasks successfully. And this is fostering language policy decisions, because I know one of your, the implications of your question was, of course, language policy. Yes. Look at how other countries do it in the first instance, and then go to one own, one's own country and say, look, these guys are having some success over here. We've got a similar problem over there. Why don't we try out that particular scenario? And that is slowly happening. I don't know what's happening in Russia. You asked me uh, what might be happening in Russia. I have no idea. And I wouldn't dare say anyway. I, I never talk about the policies of countries I don't know intimately. And the only one I know intimately is this one I'm here living in. So I notice what is happening in Britain. Um, and actually, Britain has been rather slow compared with some countries in in institutionalizing this culture of respect. It's happening now, uh, but it took a long time to develop. And far more important than national policies, it seems to me, is schools policies. I go around schools quite a lot. And one of the first questions I ask before I even dare to give a lecture in a school or a seminar in a school is, do you have a language policy? And by that, I mean, to what extent do you have this policy of respect? Uh, do you, what, to what extent do you have a clear stylistic policy? I, I used to find very frequently, less so now, but it still exists. You go into a school and the different teachers in the school teach to different norms of correctness even. Um, so one English teacher in one class uh, will, for example, teach that a certain type of construction or a certain type of spelling or a certain type of punctuation, punctuation especially, uh, is correct and the one to use. And a teacher in a different class teaches a different norm. For example, what do you do? What would you do, all you people out there, with the following sentence? The tall, dark and handsome man stood in the corner. How would you punctuate it? The tall, comma, now, comma after the word dark, before the word and, or not. Now, I see nods and shakes, and that's what would happen in if we could see everybody out there now. That some would be nodding, yes, of course you put a comma in. Some would be going, no, of course you leave the comma out. Well, I wrote a whole book on this once about punctuation called Making a Point, and one of the things I looked at was the history of this controversy. And it all goes back to the 19th century when Oxford University Press decided that the comma should be there, sometimes called the Oxford comma or the serial comma, um, in order to show parallelism between the adjectives, tall comma, dark comma, two adjectives, two commas. Therefore, that was the logic, fine. But then other presses, perhaps indeed to distinguish themselves from Oxford, decided that no, there's a better argument. The word and already shows connection. Therefore, you don't need the comma. That's doubling, that's tautology, as it were. So tall, comma, dark, and is enough. You don't need a comma there. So the world is split. Half the world puts a comma in, half the world leaves the comma out. What are we to do? Well, be consistent is the only advice I can offer to an individual writer or to an individual copy editor. And now to go back to the school, I would actually go into uh, uh, many occasions seeing that teacher, uh, teacher A advises students to put the comma into their homework. Teacher B says, no, you don't need a comma there. Leave it out. What is the poor child to do at this point? And so language policy in relation to a school. Let's talk this out, I would say to the school. Talk it out in a staff room meeting um, and uh, see if you can, if you can't agree on it, then bring the students into the discussion and say, look, this is one of those areas of English use where there is no agreement out there. So 
for Miss So and So, you put the comma in. For Miss So and So, leave the comma out. I don't know. That's not my problem. That's the school's problem. But they're going to have to have some kind of policy if the kids are going to achieve a sense of understanding of how punctuation works. And the same point applies to grammar and vocabulary and everything else. Thank you so much, Professor Christos. This was, this was the most exhaustive question. And by the way, answer. And by the way, I see here a rain of eulogies was just addressed to you in, in the internet. We have no less than a thousand, no less than a thousand people actually listening to, 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 to this broadcasting right now. Oh, it's, wonderful. It's incredible. Hello, everybody. This is great to know. <laughs> Right. So we're exceeding the BBC, actually, in the coverage at this moment. Um, and um, uh, probably one very last question, and uh, this question from uh, our colleague, Professor Alan Nazarenka. She, she, she's a person who is dealing with, with, with uh, all sorts of uh, technical gadgets and devices and the way it is used in the modern world. So, Alenid uh, Nanaki, you're welcome to ask a question, please. Um, please switch on the, your microphone. Switch on your mic microphone. Oh, yeah, that's important. All right. Or oh, we could do it in sign language. <laughs> if you can. Dear Professor Crystal, dear colleagues, uh, I feel uh, very privileged to be able to participate in this wonderful event. And my huge uh, gratitude to the organizers of the conference and to Mr. Kanurbaev personally. Thank you very much. And um, as I um, actually closely dealing with, I'm dealing with uh, uh, use of technologies in teaching English. So my question will be concerned with um, the effect of technologies on the development uh, of the language and, and of, on the future of the language. Um, so uh, my question is concerned, first of all, with a phenomenon that I see in Russia, but um, it might be common in Britain or anywhere in, else in the world, I think. I've noticed that people more and more prefer to use written communication, uh, like SMSs, for example, to oral communication. Uh, some time ago, people could talk, could have long talks on the phone. Now they have long sessions um, in, of uh, SMS exchanges. Uh, they prefer writing to talking. Why do you think? And this is sort of the first part of uh, the question. And then um, the, at the same time, the communication through technologies uh, looks like a new form of communication. It is written because it is uh, implemented. It, it, it uh, is implemented via graphic means, uh, but um, by other characteristics, it's look. It looks like um, oral communication, as if the deficit of oral communication is compensated for by this form of communication. Why do you think? Um, can be, what do you think can be the effect of this phenomenon on the language, if, if of course there is such a phenomenon, on the language and the linguistics? Mm. Ah. Well, this is one of those areas where all we can do is make judgments about what's happening at the moment, as far as we can tell, the long-term effects, very difficult to predict. We have to remember, first of all, that the whole internet phenomenon is very, very recent. In language terms, as I mentioned earlier, it's an eye blink in the history of language. Because let's get the statistics clear. When did the internet start? Apart from the geeks in California who were doing it in the 1970s and 80s, for most of us, it all started in the 1990s. That is, for most of us over a certain age, if I might put it that way. Um, so 1990, 91, we have the World Wide Web uh, coming into existence. When did you first send an email, those of you who are over that certain age? And the answer is probably not until the mid 1990s. So the email has been with us forever? No, no, only 20 odd years or so. 
when did you first go on Google to do a search? Well, you couldn't have done that until 1999, because that's when Google started. Uh, when did you first send a text message? Well, that was around about the year 2000 in Britain, uh, 2001, about four or five years later in the United States, as it happens, for text messaging. Don't know what it was in Russia, but you know, countries did these things in different ways. When did you first go into a chat room? This was probably late 1990s. Uh, when did you first blog? Well, blogger, uh, a web blog. The term begins in 1997, but most people didn't blog until the early 2000s because the technology wasn't really very easy to use. And so we can go on. Facebook, 2004. YouTube, 2005. Twitter, 2006. And since then, well, you know, Instagram, TikTok, oh, Snapchat, all sorts of things, hundreds of different platforms, um, all making use of internet technology of one kind or another. Now, the thing is that because it's all so recent, it's extremely difficult to generalize, first of all, about the situation as a whole. I would never dare do that. What I would say is that each new technology produces a new variety of some kind, and the ones that I've studied, the variety characteristics are very, very clear, um, but they change. And that's the other thing. Just because a new technology has come along doesn't mean to say that the linguistic characteristics that accompanied it when it began are going to be the same as the linguistic characteristics that we see 10 years later. And my favorite example here is Twitter. Twitter arrives in 2006, and it's effectively your text messaging for the internet, which was a crazy idea, I thought at the time. I mean, text messages are between me and you. So I send you an important text message, you, you know, I am on the train, I am eating cornflakes or whatever, and you need to know that. And so you reply to me and so on. If you had said to me in 2005 that the next big thing on the internet is going to be put your text messages up there so that everybody can read them, I would have said you were crazy. But that's exactly what it was, you see. So now I send my text message to via Twitter saying, I am eating cornflakes. Because the prompt was, what are you doing with Twitter? What are you doing? Well, I'm eating cornflakes. The world needs to know that. And actually, the world does need to know that, or did. Surprising, the number of people who want to know whether David Crystal is eating cornflakes. You know, it's, it's extraordinary. Stephen Fry is the famous case, because he was stuck in a lift somewhere, and he, texted, he sent a message to Twitter saying, I am stuck in a lift. Hundreds of thousands of people wanted to know when he was out of the lift. You know, so that's how Twitter started. What are you doing? Notice the linguistic implications. To answer the question, what are you doing? You have to use the present tense. And you used to use the first person pronoun. I am eating cornflakes. And then in November 2009, Twitter changed its prompt. The new prompt on Twitter, which is the one there today, is what's happening? What's happening? Now, as soon as you see that, it's a different world, isn't it? What's happening linguistically means not just present tense, what is happening now, but listen, what's just happened? What is about to happen? Past tenses, future expressions are going to come in. And no longer first person. Listen, he's doing something, she's doing something, they're doing something. So the linguistic character of Twitter changed dramatically in a month in 2009 and of course developed subsequently into other variations. So any poor PhD student in 2007 who thought, I am doing cutting edge research here into the latest language of the internet using Twitter, five years later, actually PhD student, you're doing historical linguistics because that's all history now, that's gone. We're in a new world now. And that is the problem with the internet. For all sorts of reasons, in reasons to do with privacy or privacy, whichever you say these days, I know no longer sure what's the norm there. Uh, but people, ch the technology companies change their criteria. 
um, and as a result, the language changes. So it's extremely difficult to, to answer one of your questions, Anna, in a sense, because of the way in which the technology companies are changing everything, and then we are responding in that way. Now, we, I've already mentioned the change in practice in relation to text messaging, which is another example of, of rapid change taking place. When you actually look at the language as a whole, though, my conclusion is that actually not that much has changed in the last 30 years, even though the mythology states the opposite. The prophets of doom always come out when a new technology arrives, don't they? This happened when the telephone came in in the 19th century. And there was a huge discussion about how it was a disaster. It was the end of society as we know it, because people will no longer want to meet it in, in public. They will only use the telephone. It's a terrible thing. When broadcasting arrived in the 1920s, prophets of doom came out and said, we're all going to be brainwashed uh, and so on. Uh, when the Internet comes along, same thing. It's going to be a disaster because language is going to change so much. But now, actually, 30 years on, what has changed exactly linguistically as a result of the Internet? And my book on language and the Internet uh, tries to explore this. It's a bit dated now, very dated, in fact, 2006. Uh, but still, the principles are the same. Um, you go, all right, what does language mean? It means vocabulary, it means grammar, it means pronunciation, it means orthography, it means discourse, and so on. Okay, check, check, check. How many grammatical constructions have changed in the last 30 years as a result of the internet? Name me a new grammatical construction that has come in, and I can't think of one. Vocabulary. Name me new vocabulary that has come in as a result of the internet. Ah, of course, we've got a thousand, two thousand, maybe three, maybe five thousand new words and expressions that have come in as a result of the internet. Is that a big deal? What? English has who knows how many words? Over a million, two million? Oh, I don't know. Five thousand new words? Is that a big deal? Not for me. That's a drop in the lexical ocean. So, um, graphics, as you said, the internet is predominantly graphic medium. So how many new uh, ortho orthographic developments have there been? Ah, here there are rather more than you might have expected. We see graphic orthographic minimalism with punctuation marks being left out, as in emails, for instance, or in chat rooms or in WhatsApp, for instance. And we also see extra punctuation marks coming in. So I say, fantastic, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And that's a novelty. And we also see a change in the, va in the value of certain punctuation marks. The famous one here is the period, the full stop, which has had quite a lot of research now uh, in uh, a medium like uh, in short messaging or in WhatsApp in particular, that kind of thing, where I make a statement. And whereas traditionally a statement would be followed by a full stop, now you see no full stop. And there's no need for two reasons. One is that the function of a full stop is to show that a sentence has come to an end and the edge of the screen does that very easily. And the other function of the full stop is to separate sentences but in a medium like WhatsApp, there is no sequence of sentences, or hardly ever, so there's no need for the full stop. So youngsters in particular, and now increasingly older people like me, now no longer use a full stop after a statement uh, in a medium like that. So if leaving out a full stop is the new normal, putting in a full stop now adds something semantic. And that's what we've discovered over the last 10, 15 years. And it started with young people. And again, it's going up the age range. Putting a full stop in adds an emotional charge to that kind of sentence. So, for example, um, are you coming to the party tomorrow evening? Yes. Johnny's coming as well. 
Johnny's coming as well with no full stop simply means Johnny's coming as well. Johnny's coming as well, full stop, means, oh dear, Johnny's coming as well. What a shame. Or something like that. Passive aggressive. And that is the new normal for young people. And I'm finding the same sort of thing affecting me now. I'm accommodating as I talk to my kids online and so on. I'm, again, cautious about using the full stop in that kind of way. So there are different changes there. So orthography indeed is an area where there is noticeable change. But even so, I would say, oh, I'm guessing now, uh, three quarters, 80% more maybe of the punctuation system uh, and the spelling system and the capitalization system, orthography, I mean, is the same as it was before. Now, your other question was about pronunciation. And that, of course, is the great unknown. The internet, the, the internet is indeed a graphic medium. Only 10% of the internet in the early 2000s was oral, aural. YouTube mainly, and a couple of other platforms that allowed you to do that. That figure has increased. And I was at an internet conference a couple of years ago where the, uh, an industry conference where the industry specialists were saying that within the next generation, so I guess they were meaning within the next 20 years or so, half the internet will be oral, aural, and not graphic. And they were pointing to things like uh, Alexa and Siri. They were pointing to things like uh, simultaneous um, uh, text to speech, translation. So you text something and out it comes a speech at your end or the other way around. You speak something and out it comes a text at your end. And I don't know whether any of you out there have been using um, some of the uh, technologies like Dragon, uh, where, I mean, I use it a lot these days. Um, you know, I am now speaking to you in the style I would use if I wanted my speech to be put down accurately in text. And back to that comment about rate of speech earlier on, it's something like 150 syllables a minute or a little more. And Dragon is 90% or, and, and the other technology, I'm not just Dragon, 90% uh, accurate these days. Tremendous progress in speech to text. It fails for three reasons. First, if you speech to speak too quickly. Secondly, if you use proper names, doesn't rec it makes a mess of proper names, it doesn't know what to do with them. Um, and thirdly, if you have a very, very strong regional accent, it's still not quite up to, a, to being able to capture everything that you're saying. But this is, you know, in 10 years, 15 years time, those problems will be solved, I have no doubt. So the internet is becoming increasingly oral and aural and YouTube is now not alone in having oral communication between, uh, on platforms of one kind and another. So to go back to the very beginning, one of the question that you, you made ages ago, light years ago, uh, the, the, it's too soon to say what is happening with speech. My prediction is that all the issues that have bedeviled us in relation to the study of speech in the past, we are going to have to live through all over again in relation to the study of speech on the internet. Just as we've had to live through a rethinking of orthography because of the nature of the medium, so I think we're going to have to have a rethinking of, um, well, phonetics and phonology as a result of the internet. Issues of accent acceptability, issues of uh, usage, conflict, you know, I mean, controversy versus controversy, that sort of thing. Uh, all the issues that we're familiar with from phonetics in relation to face-to-face -face communication are going to have to be rethought in relation to the uh, 
to, to, what, to, to the availability of the internet. The technology is becoming increasingly more perfect. Once upon a time, um, it was very difficult for certain types of phonetic effect to be clearly audible. Certain types of fricative, for example, were not easy to hear. Uh, you know, TH versus F th versus F, that kind of thing. Still, you have to spell out sometimes an awful lot of words because the word itself is not clear. A bit like you had to do over the telephone where the frequency range was not so good. Well, that's slowly improving. Um, still, it isn't perfect because of lag and whether lag will ever disappear, I don't know. Um, so, so there'll be issues there. Uh, but on the whole, I think the, the discussion has already begun in relation to the phonetic factors and the phonological factors that, that, that are likely to make a language change in, or oh, change is the wrong word. I don't mean change. I mean, add new dimensions to the language that didn't exist before. Because that is my basic principle, remember, you guys out there. When people say, is the internet changing? Uh, people usually mean changing in the sense of replacing what was there before. That's not the way I see change. Change for me is increasing the range, increasing the expressive richness of language because the new technology has added all these new dimensions that weren't there before. Just like the BBC changed English and radio generally and television changed English, not because it replaced what was there before, but because it added a whole range of new dimensions that were not there before. So now we routinely accept sports commentary and news reading and chat shows as of ordinary. Well, we're beginning to accept social media and blogging and texting and so on. And the novelties are beginning to wear off. So change means increased range, increased expressive richness. And that's the thing that I think we're likely to see increasingly as time goes by. Thank you so much, Professor Kizil. It's the most exhaustive, exhaustive answer to, 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 the, to the question that you've provided. We're not going to torture you anymore, although we, <laughs> with, the, with, with the conversing, we forget all times, all seasons, and their change, all please alike. But uh, <laughs> uh, so we, we have um, lots of questions here in the internet, but I, I will simply copy them all from, from, from this chat, and I will send it to you, and then you will just have a, have a look at the discussion that was going on here uh, under our YouTube broadcasting. Um, uh, well, be before we say goodbye to each other, just one, one last uh, advice maybe from you. What, what are you reading, I mean, fiction right now? And uh, is there anything you could recommend to our students and postgraduate, postgraduate students as an interesting uh, fiction read uh, for the fiction. future? Fiction, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's true, <laughs> you know, I, I read very little fiction. Um, I, I read basically what Hillary tells me to read. Hillary reads novels all the time. Uh, and every now and then uh, says, you must read this. And so I, I do um, read it. Uh, but on the whole, my reading is nonfiction. With one exception, I, 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 re I read an awful lot of uh, poetry. Um, and I read uh, quite a large number of plays uh, because one, one, of, one of the things I've tried to do in my life uh, is I've, I've, I've tried to write in every possible genre. Um, and that meant, of course, encountering fiction. And so many years ago, 20, 30 years ago, I wrote a couple of books of poetry so I got to know poetry. I, you know, you can't really understand poetry until you write it yourself. Uh, and, then, and then you begin to understand, wow, what the great poets did and how difficult it must have been for them. Uh, you can't understand plays until you write a play yourself. So I did in the 80s, did several television plays and radio plays and one stage play on endangered languages called Living On. It's available on the internet, uh, on my website, if you want to read it. Uh, so I, know, I now appreciate the difficulties that um, playwrights have. Now by fiction, most people usually mean novels. So you'll be pleased to hear that, uh, first of all, when I first tried to write a novel back in the 1970s or 60s even, 
I sent it in to a publisher who was very kind. You don't know how to write novels. And I said, why not? Uh, why not? And they said, because you don't know how to write about characters. I said, what do you mean? And they said, look, you've, you've written this lovely little story, or the beginning of it. I only sent in the first chapter or two. And uh, the, the, the commissioning editor said, uh, but you've just, you've not described the character. I said, well, what's the point? It's the story, it's the plot I'm talking about. Yeah, but you need to describe your characters. I can't see your characters. And I thought, oh no, it's, it's absolutely right. And it was because I was used to plays, you see, where you don't describe your character in a play because the character is there, you see the actor, uh, and you don't need to, the description is irrelevant. So I thought, oh, I'll have to learn that lesson. Uh, I tried and, and didn't enjoy it. I mean, Dickens is the most wonderful writer of characters ever. And I was thinking, I could never do that. I could never do that. So I never did a novel, ever. And that was perhaps partly because I never read so many novels. But now, last couple of years, I've changed my mind. And just six months ago, I, I wrote my first and indeed last uh, novel. Actually, it wasn't even a novel. It was a novella. Uh, you see, I was chicken. I was scared. Uh, and you'll find it online. It's on Amazon. It's called The Encyclopedia Codes. Uh, it's a spy story. Based, however, I couldn't get rid of the non-fiction element. It's based on what might have happened when we were editing the Cambridge Encyclopedia in this very room. What might have happened. And it's all about spies and things like that. And I enjoyed writing it. But reading it, I would say it's still pretty weak on character description. I don't think you'll be able to see the characters because I, I just can't do it. So I know my limitations, but I have tried. That's the thing, I have tried. So I should read more novels. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, and I, I, I promise to do, to do so. But at the moment, I don't, as it were, have a, have a favorite. Uh, my favorite collection that I, I uh, refer to uh, in poetry is, is Seamus Heaney's. Uh, collection of poetry that came out a couple of years ago. That 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 is my favourite one there. Um, the uh, my favourite, insofar as I've read a novel recently. Again, the, the non-fiction element comes in. It was it was a a novel on Shakespeare called Hello, Mr. Shakespeare, or something like that. I've forgotten the name of it now. You see, I can't even remember the names of novels, let alone what they're about. So I'm afraid. Um, I'm not answering your question as well. As you, you are, you are. No, actually, you are answering your question. <laughs> my question. Listen, listen to you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, on behalf of all my colleagues here, and there's a huge audience that is internet that was listening to us in the internet, I thank you very much, Professor Crystal, for for, for this invaluable this opportunity to just to, to to listen to you and to see your vision of the future of English and how it develops. It's you, you believe believe me, it's 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 highly important for for our students and postgraduate students because we don't have this access to to people like you every day. And so this so today we today we have a just a complete luxury of communication actually with you and uh, ask, asking you all these all these questions. Um, well, then I, I have the luxury in return, you know, uh, the luxury of getting all these these questions and make, make, making me think in, a, in in new ways and different ways that's the beauty of it that's the, that's the best bit about lecturing to students isn't it and especially if you have a PhD student or something like that you know the brilliant questions that come at you and the observations and the comments so you know I, I've learned today as, as well uh, some, some of the ways you've been thinking about things and this is mutually beneficial but I'm delighted that you found it so and it's been a privilege and a, and a pleasure to uh, to have this opportunity. Um, as I say, I'd far rather be in Moscow uh, having a pleasant drink with you all now after a seminar of this kind. That's not going to happen. But I will go and have a drink anyway. I think, <laughs> and, uh, and toast your ongoing health. And as they say in the new normal these days in winding up, stay safe, everybody. Look after yourselves. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Kessel. I wish you all the best. And please give our best regards to Hillary and for her patience and her, her, her advice. I certainly will. Thank you, Martin. Thank, thank you. Goodbye, everybody. And thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, goodbye. Valuable. Thank you very much. Thank you.